Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, Finance Friday Edition, where we interview Shane and talk about cutting expenses. I'm wondering if you're asking from a financial standpoint, I, I think I think you're in trouble here, frankly. I think you, and I think that's why you probably came on the show. You you have a lot, a, a huge amount of debt here. Yeah. Um, you're not generating any cash flow, although we will get to the cash flow. Like it's clear that that's you're not racking up cash that you can then use to prepay this debt. Is that right? Right. And I, I I'm wondering if there if a, if a big reset might not be the answer here to do this, and you just sell both of those properties, take that cash, and wipe out a significant chunks of the chunks of this debt. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen. And with me as always is my charming co-host, Scott Trench. And with me as always is my throat tickling co-host, Mindy Jensen. <laughs> Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else. To introduce you to every money story, because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or completely reset your financial position, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I am very excited to talk to Shane today because he doesn't have a perfect situation, but he does have some easy wins and some hard decisions to make. I think that having a discussion with his wife is going to be the number one recommendation for him. Um, and I think that there's a lot of things to think about. I I, I do want to reiterate that when we make suggestions, these are just suggestions. And our suggestions should not be jumped into with both feet. I think you should take these into consideration and really weigh the pros and cons before making your decision. But then make your decision and follow through with it. Yeah. And, and I, I have pretty extreme thoughts on how to, how, how to, how to reconcile some of the, the issues that I found in, in, in Shane's position. And I will address, I address those throughout the episode, but I will also address those in the outro to kind of wrap those thoughts together. Um, and I stand by th those thoughts. I think that that is, that, that is the approach that I would take if I were swapping places with Shane. That's valid. Scott, what is up with you? How is the dad life treating you? Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, our baby girl is, is uh, beautiful, snuggly, warm, loud, um, and, <laughs> and, and just wonderful. We're, we're so thrilled. So Sleeping through the night, right? Not sleeping through the night. Yeah. yeah. We're, <laughs> I'm a little tired. <laughs> that only lasts... Uh... Well, we're going on Two 15 years. years. I'll let you know yeah. when they sleep through the night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, let's bring in Shane. Today, we're talking with Shane, who has a great salary, but also some pretty significant expenses. In fact, during his application to be on the show, he noted that his biggest pain point is blowing through the budget. Shane, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. Thanks so much. Appreciate that, Mindy and uh, Scott. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on the show. I, uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> I love that. Well, let's jump into your numbers. First, we have a salary of $8,800 a month, which is quite nice. I'll take that. Thank you very much. Uh, with a bonus of $10,000, which is paid out over quarter. So approximately up to $2,500 is the potential uh, per quarter. The expenses is where I am going to focus some time on because I think there are some wins, some easy wins here for you. We have a mortgage of $1,799, which is uh, at a 2.99% interest rate. Hooray, $23 monthly HOA, $300 for utilities, which are water, gas, and electric. Gasoline is $50 to $150 a month. Groceries are $1,200. Restaurants are seven hundred and fifty dollars. Household, you have between six fifty and seven hundred. Solar panels, eighty dollars. Subscriptions, two hundred and twenty-four dollars. The gym is one hundred and twenty. Shopping and entertainment is four to five hundred dollars a month. Car is three hundred and fifty-seven dollars. Phone bill is two hundred and ninety-two dollars. Student loans, fifteen hundred dollars a month. We will come back to this one. Miscellaneous, $500 to $1,000. We're also going to come back to this one. Charity, about $100 a month. 
travel 500 to 1,000 yearly, and then you had some expenses that weren't separated out into business expenses, but I did that for you. Agency, which is real estate agency, $200 a month. Mortgage number two, 1,836. HOA number two, holy cow, I'm sorry, I didn't read this until just now, $720 a month, Uh, utilities $150 a month, so I'm wondering if the HOA covers some of those utilities, and a HELOC of $400 a month. Those are the expenses. Then we have debts. We talked about the student loans just a moment ago. The student loans total $141 thousand dollars with variable interest rates from 4.25 percent all the way up to 8.5 percent and there's a mix of federal loans and private loans uh, you have a primary mortgage at of 321 thousand at 2.99 percent a second mortgage at 275 thousand it's on a different house I'm sorry not a second mortgage of 275 thousand at 3.86 percent another great rate a HELOC of 81000 at 5%, a car of 15000 at 2.9%, solar panels, $15,000 at 1%, couches, $2,000 at 0% for 60 months, family credit card, 9000 at 24%. I really want to stop right here and tell you do everything you can to pay this off immediately. Um, business card number one, $6,000, and business card number two, $1,000. And then we have investments of $80,000 in the 401k, $4,000 in savings, $27,000 in the short-term rental bank account to help pay for bills and cover the low spots when there's a slow period. The second property, we have $12,000 invested. And then fund rise and in quotes, play stocks, $1,500. So Shane where can Scott and I help you most? What is your biggest pain point? Yeah, my biggest pain point um, is, like you said in the beginning, is is really um, overspending on our monthly um, expenses. I, I had an original budget in plan. Um, it, it's just we're having a tough time sticking to that particular budget. Who's we? My, my wife and I. Awesome. And is that does that income include both your incomes? It does, yep. And that's all pre eighty eight hundred pre tax with ten k pre tax. Uh pre tax, correct. Okay, so eighty eight hundred a month. Um, let me do this quick math. So that's one hundred and five a year um, between the two of you, plus forty, so one hundred and forty five thousand dollars annually. Yep. Um, you're probably bringing home give or take a hundred grand after healthcare and taxes and other deductions. Is that is that it? Sound about right. Sounds about right. Well, great. My, I, I think this. I, I think there's two themes here that I want to dig into. One is what Mindy said, the expense side, and the other is um, the consumer consumer debt. You have a lot of a lot of things that are financed right now, sucking cash out of your position on a monthly basis. And I think that combining that, it sounds like there's a lack of control over the discretionary expenses that are coming out on a monthly basis. Does that do those sound like they're in the right ballpark? Yeah, it sounds pretty good. And I want to add to that too, of uh, kind of controlling our monthly budget. I think adding to that as well is I want to take uh, the projection of, I guess, my life path with money, but also entrepreneurship. Um, I have my W2 um, workload right now, but I have my real estate license. I started following bigger pockets because I am learning a lot more in this past couple of years about real estate uh, investing. And I want to take, um, I have been spending some time and money um, towards those different ventures of let's call it direct mail, um, those sort of things that are in that um, credit card budget, we'll say, um, that are growing over time. So my plan is where do I kind of, I guess, spend time and money to grow maybe my other side of the of uh, this venture that I want to take, this journey that I want to take in, in life to uh, to entrepreneurship. All right, Shane. What, what one of the first things that pops out here is a number of consumer, a, a large amount of consumer debt. We've got fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars in credit cards. We've got two thousand dollars on top of that. That's eighteen thousand dollars for couches. We've got fifteen thousand dollars on solar panels. So that now we're at what 
$33,000. We've got a car at $15,000. That's $48,000 in consumer debt. We've got the HELOC, which I would consider consumer debt, um, although it may have been used to purchase a second home. Um, and I So I want, I want to hear about what, what of that is consumer debt and what of that was used for investment purposes. Walk me through those things, because if, that, if, if my read on that is true, then we're actually spending a lot more than what you had, what you listed in this, um, in this monthly expense. And we're, we're substantially negative. Um, if that, if that, if that's, if that worry is, is founded. Right. And I think, uh, the 6,000, uh, that's in the credit cards does need to be paid off from some of the savings account for the short term rental. So, um, that one is a little bit of my, I would call it my business account. Um, per- I guess my personal account to pay off some of the short term debts that I haven't paid off yet as well as um, the stuff that I pay for my agency uh, ventures. And then the other credit card is just one that uh, with the 9,000 right now that did get away from us um, slowly over time. We have in the budget to pay it off every month, um, but then we get stuck with maybe a thousand or $2,000 every month. Um, and then it just kind of keeps climbing and we've been in that cycle for the past six months now, and I'm trying to figure out where that came from. Um, and in the past month, I would say I probably saved a couple thousand. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question in terms of like how I got with all those debts and then where I calculated them from? How, yeah, how'd you rack up this 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 $115,000 in debt, give or take? Including student loans and, and the mortgage and all that kind of stuff? This actually does not include the student loans. So the HELOC is 81, the car is 15, solar panels are another 15, the couches are 2,000, and then the credit cards are another six, 16. Yep. So the couch um, we got when we purchased the house three years ago. Um, the other couch does go for the short term rental. The $80,000 is what we used for the short term rental. Uh, we used about $30,000 of that for the renovation of the condo uh, that we have um, currently. And then another 20000 for furnishings. Um, so that puts us at roughly 50 and then we spent another, um, 10 or so thousand of that through the, we bought it in January. We didn't start renting it out till April through the renovations. So paying back the mortgage through that, um, that fund as well. And then I think I still have about $10,000 of it sitting in the account. Great. So did you have this other credit card debt and, you know, these student loans and these other types of things? Like, I'm sure you had the student loans. Why did you decide to buy the short-term rental instead of paying off the, that debt? So why we bought the short-term rental, um, it's kind of a long story, but to make the long story short, uh, I wanted to get into real estate investing. Um, we had our primary house already, and I know that our house through the um, past couple of years, like most markets have grown in equity substantially. So I knew that I had a source there and then I, um, I left my job previously and then I took the same job back with this company where I could access a loan through my 401k and realized that I could use that money to, um, find an asset that could make me money so I could use that income down the line or in the future to pay off my other debts. So I would want to use the income to pay off my debts versus using my house debt to pay off my other debts because I did lock in such a low interest rate when we did buy it. Great. Do we have a 401k loan as well to know, that we should know about? Uh, I, I do. So I don't know if that's on there or not. Um, that isn't a part of the $8,000 income. It's not. Okay. I might have left that one out. Um, yeah, I'm that one's about 40000 40000 for the down payment on the condo. And that is at four and a half percent. All right. Um, what, what, walk me through the numbers on this. How much is the the second the, the Airbnb worth right now? The debt balance is two seventy five. And what what is the income that you're generating from the property? And how do you calculate that? Yeah. So we owe about two seventy five. Um, we'll go to that seven hundred dollar HOA fee. Uh, that includes um, everything besides uh, the electricity on the property. So it includes water, sewage, garbage, maintenance of the property. Um, in it, it's kind of tough to break it down. So right now, uh, my expenses are about three thousand dollars a month. Um, 
with the HOA on top of the mortgage for the property and then the expenses. Plus, if you want to include um, the loan that I took against the 401k that I pay back into the 401k, um, that adds probably another $700 on top of it. So I calculated it to be around, um, was that $40,000, $45,000 a year for expenses on the property. And since running since April, we've grossed 50. Okay. So April, so where's the property located? In uh, North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So you're not going to, so that that 50 is great through since April, but you're not going to get anywhere near that for the other six, seven months of the year. That, that's going to be the big income. Those are going to be the income months. What do you anticipate for November through March, through April, um, for the next six months? Yeah, so November, uh, December, January um, are, are typically slow. Uh, there are usually long-term rentals, uh, long-term renters in the area. We have a long-term renter um, scheduled for, uh, well, I guess, more midterm rental for January, February of next year that already locked in. Um, but they're doing it for about um, 3000 bucks for the months versus um, that's probably what we make a, a week in the, in the summertime. Is that per month or, or $1,500 per month? It's 1500 per month, yeah. So I, th- I think it's reasonable to assume $1,500 for six of the months of the year. What is that? 3000 6000 9000 plus 50000 for the other six months of the year to reflect the seasonality of the business. Is that a, is that a reasonable assumption, you think? 59000 in total annual income? I would say that's yeah, close to the projections, what it's, what it's looking at right now, yeah. Okay, and what is this property worth? So we did renovations on it. Um, some of the units are selling unrenovated, closer to the 400000 mark. Um, the ones that are more renovated on the oceanfront side of the building, ours is kind of adjacent oceanfront, um, are selling into the mid fours. So what you think, a 400 is reasonable? Yeah, I would say that's a safe bet. Okay. I like, I like how you broke down those expenses. So we have $60,000 in income. We'll round up to 60 and we've got $45,000 in annual expenses, including your mortgage payment, HOA, utilities, so on and so forth. So that leaves you with 15,000 in income and you've got $125,000 invested in the property and equity in the property right now. Um, right. I do think you'll have some items on top of that. So we need a cushion of about $200 a month to, to, to take on for that. But, but that, that's pretty, that, that's reasonably close there. I, I think that my instincts before I, before I went through those numbers were that you should sell the Airbnb and that would greatly simplify the position. I know that, that you just bought it in April um, with that and, and just renovated it. But my instinct, and I think, I think that's not changing here. I think that there are some advantages. You could argue that you can, you're scraping out a return there, but we got to look at your whole position here. You've got 141,000 in student loan debt. You've got a $275,000 second mortgage. You've got $81,000 HELOC on your primary $40,000. I mean, ju- just excluding the mortgages, you've got 120 plus 140 is $260,000 in in non-mortgage debt there, um, which you can really make a significant dent in. And then you've got another thirty, forty-five thousand dollars in debt that is really bad debt. And, 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 and to be frank, in a couple of cases, like the credit card debt, um, you know, uh, the car loan and that, and, and I guess the solar panels and car loan are at low interest rates, but they're still not, they're still consumer debt. They're not helping, helping your situation here. Um, and that's really a lot of debt against the income that the property is generating and your 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 primary position with this. Let me ask you about your primary more home as well. What's that worth? How long have you been living there? So we bought it in 2020 for 368. Yeah, and I put about 35,000 down on it, so that's what brings us to roughly the 320 that it's worth or the 320 left on the loan. Um and homes in the area are selling. Obviously we're in a in a fluctuating market. Um Things have sold for 640, I want to say four or five months ago, and now homes are sitting. So um, I think they're selling closer to six now in my neighborhood. Okay. So that one, that one we have a lot of equity in. I, I'm wondering, I, you know, I, and, and I, know, I know this is really hard, and, and we're talking about a big, big thing here. It's like, crush my wife's heart. <laughs> yeah. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you're asking from a financial standpoint, I, I think 
I think you're in trouble here, frankly. I think you, and I think that's why you probably came on the show. You, you have a lot, a, a huge amount of debt here. Yeah. Um, you're not generating any cash flow, although we will get to the cash flow uh, situation, you know, in, in your life. Like it's clear that that's, you're not racking up cash that you can then use to prepay this debt. Is that right? Right. And I, I, I'm wondering if there, if a, if a big reset might not be the answer here to do this and you just sell both of those properties, take that cash and wipe out a significant chunks of the, chunks of this debt, um, and, and get, and get set up in a new scenario that enables you to save a lot of cash. I'm going to hold that thought for now and we'll come back to that. Cause that's a huge, <laughs> that's the biggest piece of it. That's the biggest change, um, I've ever recommended on the show here, but that's where my instinct is, frankly, in your situation, because of the what, what I think is a, lo- a crushing amount of debt that's coming up, c- coming against your, your position here, that's really going to c- limit your flexibility. And if you do that, you'd free up close to $350,000, which would really dig you out after paying off the mortgages, the two mortgages, which would put you in a, in a nice positive situation to be- then begin thinking about next steps here. You could make an investment out of that that's more sustainable given your situation, and you'll probably be able to clear out a lot of the... Uh, You'll probably be able to, to to move or something that in a way that would enable you to spend less on your housing on a regular basis um, and, and cut expenses. Go ahead, Mindy. The only thing that makes me not want to agree with you is the fact that he has an investment loan on this property at 3.86%, which is not coming around again for a while. I agree with that. And that, that pains me. But here's the thing is you're, you're stuck in this, even even when we go through the advice that Mindy's going to talk about with your personal financial situation, you are going to be grinding it out for five years, in my opinion, um, easily before your position materially changes, where you're able to then stop that grind and you'll begin having free cash flow with which to invest or do some of the things you want to, you, you might want to do to enjoy your life. So I, I agree that that's a huge deal just to, to exit these these loans. Um, at, at these low interest rates, but I mean, it's just, it's all compounded against you at this point, And you have this, this huge, you, you, you got, I mean, I, how much do I want to add up here? We said a hundred and I'll, I'll do the math here and come back to that, but go ahead, Mindy. Fin- okay. Then I'll talk for a minute because I can hear people listening saying, but he's got such a low rate. Yes, he does have a low rate. And if we go into the expense side, we can find some quick wins to pay down a couple of these credit cards. Um, and and just because we suggest something doesn't mean you have to do it. These are just suggestions. But this is uh, time to have a conversation with your spouse and talk about what you want for the future, what you want for the next five years, what's worth giving up and what's worth keeping in your life. And that, you know, the Airbnb is on that on is up for discussion with the you know, worth keeping versus worth getting rid of. But back into your uh, your expenses, your primary residence, I see nothing to discuss with your mortgage, your HOA, or your utilities. Gasoline being 50 to 150 bucks a month, nothing to discuss. Groceries and restaurants, you're at almost $2,000 for your small family every month for food. So... I'm wondering why this is so high. I'm thinking that there is some sort of like organic food all the time or Whole Foods is the only place you shop or perhaps there's some dietary restrictions or allergies. I mean, I've got some cousins who have some pretty significant allergies and groceries is just always going to be expensive for them. Um, But if that isn't the case, then I would encourage you to look for ways to cut your expenses at the groceries. There's the, what is it, the the dirty dozen where you should always buy these fruits organic because they spray so much pesticides on them if they're not organic. And then there's other fruits, like avocados do not need to be organic. That skin is tough as leather. They're not putting any pesticides on the avocado. Uh, <laughs> same with coconuts. You don't need organic coconuts. They're literally covered in wood. No <laughs> pests are getting in there. I always think that's the dumbest thing is when your I coconut, see- What's your coconut budget, Shane? <laughs> 
coconuts are currently not in the budget, but, uh, uh, you know, I like the shredded ones, you know, go on cakes and stuff. Okay. Well, when you do have coconuts in your line item, uh, make sure that you're not buying organic because you don't need to. Also, that brings up another point. Um, we're joking about line items for coconuts, but your miscellaneous category is 500 to a thousand dollars. And I think that that means that you have items in there that could be categorized someplace else. And they're just kind of being lumped into miscellaneous and miscellaneous is a, a really double edged sword, great and awful category. Um, because it you oh I don't know what this is that's just miscellaneous but then it adds up really really quickly I think miscellaneous is a fifty to a hundred dollar category and if it's costing more money than it needs its own category so you can see this wow I was putting coffee in miscellaneous but I'm spending so much on it it needs its own category I really do value coffee enough so I'm going to take something else out of my budget so that I can afford this or you know whatever it is that's in there right now. Um, Questions about the subscriptions. You have $224 in monthly subscriptions. What are these subscriptions and do you really need all of them? That's a great question. Uh, so right now it's our cable and internet. So I think also that includes our phone bill. So I'm pretty sure that includes the phone bill. Phone bill is about $200 for AT&T for just my wife and I, unlimited package. Um, it includes Hulu TV, so that's seventy dollars for the um, TV package, and then I think that all comes with like uh, the Disney package, which is like another twelve dollars. Um, trying to think of what other subscriptions we have. Um, I go to the tennis, so being a part of this association, there's a tennis club with the pool that we have. So the pool is seventy nine dollars a month. And then I go to a couple tennis classes a month, so like another twenty to thirty dollars for the classes. I would challenge you to look at your usage of each one of those things. You're paying seventy dollars for Hulu TV. How much are you actually watching it? And could you be spending your time in a different way? You've we've alluded to education, real estate education. Maybe if you take that line item out of your budget and put it towards education, you're spending your time in a different way. You're not watching TV. And I don't mean to be preachy, but TV is just going to rot your brain. Anybody? <laughs> and some of those other ones, like, are you really using your tennis membership? Is there a way to pay for drop-in classes that's less expensive? Are you really using your pool membership? Or is it all like lumped in together? Um, you do have a phone bill here of $292 that's separate from the subscriptions. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is my own uh, cell phone provider. And it's something like $15 or $25 a month for four gigs. And then like another $10 a month for another gig or another four gigs or whatever. Like I never use all of it, so I don't care how much it is. Um, I would encourage you to look at how much you're using your phone. Do you really need the unlimited package? Like are you using just a bajillion gigs or are you using two or three and you could get by with a $25 a month phone bill for each of you? That's a huge savings. I mean, let's look at your phone bill right here, $292 versus my $50 a month. Now you have $242 to throw at your credit cards. You've paid off one of them in four months. And then you've got all that money to spend on something. You know, it just keeps going when you have, when you're pulling these little bits out. The same with the groceries in the restaurant. If you could get that $750 out of the restaurant budget, don't go out to restaurants at all this next month. Your grocery bill might go up a little bit, but your restaurant budget will go down so much. $750, that's almost one entire credit card down here. Plus the $242 that I just found you in your phone bill, and you've paid off an entire credit card. Uh, student loans we already talked about. Shopping and entertainment, you've got four to $500. How much of this do you really need to spend? Could you cut that out in one month and make a dent in another credit card? Could you cut that back so that you're still enjoying your life, but not spending so much money? Um, I think that this is this is just an opportunity to have a conversation with your spouse and have, you know, what really brings us joy. 
We had Liz Frugalwoods on way back on episode 10, and she discussed when she and her husband first discovered financial independence, they got rid of everything. They cut out absolutely everything that wasn't totally essential to their budget. And for a month, they lived as frugally as possible. And then they're like, okay, well, that wasn't great. Let's start adding things back in. And they discovered that when they added things back in, they were like making a game out of it. How can I add this back in, but cheaply? So a conversation to have with your spouse, because it's not going to work if you tell her, hey, we're going to just get rid of everything. She's Her answer is not going to be, oh, sure, that's going to be great. Well, let me, let me ask you on that point, let me ask you this. How, what are, what is the relationship with money in your household? Is this a positive one? Do you guys typically get along with that? Is it a source of stress? Is it a, is it a something that you guys are aligned on? Good question. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, we, we are, and we aren't, um, we, we definitely both talk about it from time to time. And, and you know, I'm the one that more so runs the books and, uh, and, and my wife kind of she has access to obviously all the accounts that we have. Um, so she sees where all the dollars are coming from. And honestly, she's always had the greater um, credit score and stuff like that. So the one that has the the largest, um, uh, I wouldn't say budget on it is, uh, is her original credit card and I was added to it. So um, she's always had the good credit score. <laughs> and I've always been the one that uh, with my student loans and everything, um, I think kind of depleted <laughs> my, my credit score. So she definitely lifted me up there. Um, but it's something that I try to monitor and, and, and kind of like incorporate and figure out, I guess, a game plan on how we can tackle it. But, but um, I just never had a good strategy on how to exactly not necessarily have that conversation, but really to other than, you know, spend less money at the grocery store, which it, it seems to be a big, big candle. I, I don't you know, I don't really exactly know where to take it and be less extreme or be more extreme. Right? What, what's the emotion you feel when we talk about your financial position? Um, I, I think <laughs> my thoughts on my, uh, financial situation, it took a big toll. Um, I, I was doing sales position in New Jersey three years ago, right before the pandemic, when I moved down to North Carolina to be closer to family and to start a family. Um, I, I was making closer to $157,000 a year, um, and, and took probably to start a new position. And this is where I, took the position to think there was going to be future growth and it just never really got there. Um, so I feel a little frustrated in the position because I was doing so well before and we were um, saving substantially, you know, in 2020 and 2019 that now it's kind of like a, a snowball effect of, I think income creep is, is a good portion of it. Um, for when we were in New Jersey and, and we had the, the extra cash and we were able to, uh, spend a little bit extra. I think our um, habits just never really um, came to fruition when obviously we took the new role and new new roles came in. Um, hence why I, I got my real estate license and I'm trying to figure out new ways to increase my, my income. Do you sell many properties? Um, purely referral just because of the W-2. Not necessarily takes up all my time, but it is a big portion of the day. So I'm, what I'm selling, and to answer your question is what I'm selling is it just covers my, my costs. Like I'll maybe make $2,000, $4,000 at the end of the year. Okay. How many referrals are you doing a month or a year? Two to three a year. Okay. I, I, I did some math here while you guys were going over the, the numbers. When I add it all up, you have $907,200 in total debt. That includes both your mortgages that includes your student loans, that includes the HELOC, that includes the 401k loan, all that kind of stuff. Another headline number here is you generate $8,800 per month in income pre-tax. I taxed you at a 25% rate. Um, that puts you at $6,600. Uh, that's your take-home pay per month. You're spending $7,900 per month. And the budget that you provided us does not include one-timers. So couches or whatever that, that will, that, that, uh, that I think you should budget for. And I would, I would put that in the ballpark of 500 to a thousand a month on top of that. So this is not the, the emotion I would be feeling here is extreme anxiety, frankly, looking at your, your, looking at your position. Um, and I think you nailed it in the diagnosis of it sounds like you were making more a year or two ago, a few years ago, and you're not making that today. And the numbers do not work. And the result of that is, debt after debt after debt after debt after debt that you're taking out in order to finance both your lifestyle and these investments. 
and this is not this is not a sustainable position. And I think that uh, you are you are likely going to need to. You're either going to do it now, or you're going to do it in a few months when things are really bad. Right now, you you have the control to do this. You're going to have to have a very unpleasant conversation with your wife um, that outlines these things and says this is this is not sustainable. We don't have an option here. We must make some materially large changes. Those can either be on the expense side, and I can cut out um, significantly, um, and we can go line by line and just cut, 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 cut. I don't really love that approach because even if you do that, you're going to get back to break even, and then you're going to be treading water for 10 years is how I'm reading the situation. Unless, unless you get some gifts handed to you on the income front, like a new job opportunity. Not, not, that's not a gift. Unless you go out and find a way to earn significant... You get lucky to a certain extent. Opportunity comes your way um, with that. If, if these properties decline in value, that's going to put you even more of a hole um, at some point. And bigger pockets, Dave Meyer, um, I, I, and I agree with him, is predicting a 6 to 10% decline in housing prices over the next 12 months. That that should that should put some anxiety that should increase the anxiety level here to to a certain degree, and my read on the situation is because of those headlines, I would do two very significant resets in your position, or I would sig- seriously consider them. I'd seriously consider selling both properties, clearing that million bucks minus transaction costs, and paying off substantial amounts of the debt. Maybe even just starting fresh and trying to get as much cash as possible. You might be left with some debt, probably in the student loan. I, I would consider two two things: one, paying off that both or selling both of those mortgages, or selling both of those properties, paying off the mortgages and paying off as much debt, even though it's a lot of it's at low interest rates as possible, to get just a clean slate here, and maybe consider renting for a while or consider a house hack um, with that. And then I'd also you're also going to have to go through the budget here and go line by line and say, what am I willing? What what, do, what what is a necessity here? I love the fact that you play tennis at this this club. That's a great use of funds if you're playing tennis with that. But you can't have the tennis and the car payment and the, 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 the shopping budget here and the travel budget and the, 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 the significant groceries and restaurants budget. You're going to have to pick a few of those things. You're, you're not in a position where you earn so little income that you can't afford to have a few luxuries, but you can't have the amount of luxuries you have currently because it's bleeding your position. And so neither of those dis- discussions is going to be pleasant with your wife here. But you're gonna you're either gonna have them now, or I, I will bet you that you're gonna have them within six to twelve months, and they're gonna be very very unpleasant because you're gonna be taking on yet more very unpleasant debt, or forced to make decisions on someone else's timeline, and that's really harsh. But that, that's 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 frankly how I'm reading your situation. What, what's your reaction to that? Um, it, it, it's kind of half of what I expected. Um, I guess half of um, maybe some optimism on my side of maybe a way to, to kind of figure my way. I guess my, my thoughts were fight fire with fire. Um, mostly because I, I walked out of college. Um, I went to an engineering school, you know, lots of debt. I didn't have any help to pay off any of my college student loans. So um, I, I already knew that when I took my first job in New Jersey, uh, I incrementally made steps to increase my income. I was making sixty thousand dollars starting out, and then I, you know, stepped it up over year after year, probably twenty percent or more growth in my income. Um, so it, it went from we literally bought an HBO subscription when we first moved to New Jersey, and we didn't go out with friends, we didn't do anything. We, you know, were maybe making uh, probably breaking even if not at, not at all. Um, with a fourteen hundred dollar rent, we had you know fourteen hundred dollars in student loans. Um, we would just literally sat home on the weekend and caught up on Game of Thrones and, and Dilly did that for a year until I was able to to increase my income. So um, been there before, and I think that's a big case of maybe why we're in the situation that we're in now. Of uh, we felt the pain, we don't want to go back to the pain. Um, but it looks like now we're in the situation we're kind of blind to our situation. And we probably have to feel the pain a little bit more, especially with um, inflation going up and the grocery bills going up and, and really feeling all these extra different little things that have impacted, um, I guess, the way we do things. So uh, in terms of selling our properties, um, I don't mind. It, it's, obviously, it's going to hurt the heart a little bit, right? Like we, we got the um, we've been going to Myrtle Beach with our family for we're from upstate New York. We've been going to, to Myrtle Beach for over 15 years. Um, so it wasn't just like a, we bought a place as an investment, um, which, it, you know, it feels like it's doing well. But obviously, um, 
it's a piece of who we are as well. So one thing just to put the nail in the coffin on your, yeah. your, 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 your vacation rental here is yeah. we talked about those expenses at 45,000 and I'd add a few, I'd add a little bit more padding. You do have a cash flow positive property here if, if right. with that. So it's not like you're getting, you're getting crushed here, but the problem is the way you financed it. You've got mm-hmm. $81,000 in a HELOC and you've got $40,000 in your 401k loan. That's $120,000 in debt, right? hundred. Yep. Now I think you should never assume that a HELOC is um, anything longer than a five-year payback, right? This is not a 30-year loan that you're getting. This is a variable interest rate loan. That interest is going to increase. And I, I think if you're thinking about it, so if you, if you agree with me that you should pay back your HELOC within five years, that is $2,000 a month that you need to pay back, not including the interest payments on your HELOC, on the HELOC and 401k loan, which I'll, I'll combine as right. a single loan product in this. So that that's what is killing this investment is not the fact that it you, you, pro- you probably bought a good property. It probably does reasonably well from a cash flow perspective, but the $120,000 in short-term financing from your 401k and HELOC, that's what's crushing your... That, that's why this property is going to suck cash out of your life for at least the next five years in a really meaningful way, on top of the fact that you already are cash flow negative before we even get to those, those early payment payments. Okay, because Scott feels that you are cash flow negative, super negative on this property, I'm going to give you a research opportunity to look into what other short-term rental owners in the area are doing with their properties while uh, in the down season. Is there any other opportunity for you to generate more income? January, February in Myrtle Beach is going to be um, not amazing, but perhaps in March you could rent it out higher or there's parties or, you know, specific things like Christmas is big or Thanksgiving or like whatever, you know, what, what other people are doing will help you make some decisions as well. Um, Also episode 299 of our show, we interviewed Beth from budgetbites.com. That's B Y T E S. And she makes some amazing recipes. I've never made a recipe from her that was terrible. They're all delicious and they're all very inexpensive. So if you're looking for ways to cut down on going out to eat last minute, if you're looking for ways to cut down on your grocery budget, that's a fantastic website and it's a great episode. It's called budgetbites.com, B-Y-T-E-S. Uh, so those are two opportunities for you. But I think that they're the, you know, one of the best things you can do is just sit down with your wife and see what are some opportunities for us to cut money out of our spending where could we look for more income? Could you get a different job? Could she get a different job? Could you go back to your New Jersey salary? Are they still hiring? You know, is could it be a work from home situation? Are there opportunities for weekend gigs that generate income? Um, there's no shortage of ways to make money. It's just what I mean, there's also, you know, a limited amount of time in the day. I, I would say I, I love those questions. You should ask all of them. I am operating under the assumption that if you could make much more significantly more money, you would be doing that. And so I think that that should factor into your discussion there where it's like, no, income is not going to save us in the short run here. Because again, this is this is about your happiness in your, in, in, in your life and and flexibility and financial freedom, right? And you're, you are at least five to seven years, probably closer to 10 years away from muscling through this situation before you're really able to accumulate any type of runway, like a emergency reserve. Yeah. I wouldn't really accumulate an emergency reserve of any material amount until you paid off the nine, you know, five, 400,000 of the $900,000 in debt that you have here. So, I and mean, that's just so far away that I think, I think that's where the, the, the really big discussions around your capital allocation, particularly these two properties and how much of that debt you have. Um, and then, and then really cleaning up the, uh, making sure you get to a point where you have a 2000, at least monthly surplus in cash flow, um, from, from your, your expenses. Um, and that will require significant changes. And again, I think that if you don't have that conversation, you have a very real risk of having that conversation in a much less healthy way 
six months to a year down the road. And again, that's not good news. I'm not trying, I'm, I'm really emphasizing this point and I feel very bad about it, but I also feel like I'd be doing you a disservice if I said anything different. Yeah, no, you guys have been, been great in terms of the, the realistic expectations. And um, so I, I want to say that, yeah, this being the first time going into real estate venture, um, gaining a new skill, that was kind of more the game plan. Um, so it, it was more so a long-term approach. And like I said, I wanted to kind of fight fire with fire. And, and, and to your point, this is maybe um, a more analytical approach of uh, we need to look more internally shorter term than longer term and, and figure out a way to um, either incre- increase that income, whether it's a different W-2 or, or a different uh, you know, business venture that's going to bring in a little bit more money than the way I have um, with real estate. But I still now have that knowledge with real estate that I can um, chase in, in the interim. Um, and, and I think that's a good point. And I think it's a good, good, tough conversation that I'm going to have to have with uh, with my wife. Um, it's more so I think she's uh, okay with letting go of the property. It's more me that's tied to the property, just because it is my my first um, real estate kind of uh, venture. So I obviously feel very tied to it. So um, the the sh- selling the short term rental gets you moderately out of some of the the trouble that you're in because you've got 125,000 in equity on that and you're going to you're going to send 10% of that 40 40k uh in transaction costs. Now you are an agent so you can sell the property especially if you do the work to get licensed in uh there to shave off a couple of those points, but you're not going to clear 125,000, you're going to clear 100 grand on that property and that's not even enough to pay off your HELOC or your or your 401k balance plus the mortgage. So that, that's part of it. The big thing you, you, I think you should consider is selling your primary home where you unlock $300,000 and, and all that. And that's really hard because you have a great interest rate on that property. But I think, again, that you are, you are in a hole and that those two properties combined are what has dug, that dug you very – are a huge contributor with that. And if you do that, you, you wipe out almost all your debt and now you can begin accumulating cash. You can then go back into – you know, Dave Ramsey baby steps here, right? All of the debt is paid off. You've got cash. Now you can begin investing. And if you want to reattack real estate investing in two years, when you've got $60,000, no debt, um, and, you know, really, really strong credit score, and you want to put that down on a property, that's as your down payment instead of a HELOC, then you're golden. There's no reason not to get back into it from position of financial strength, but that you're, you're just digging your, you just have so much more digging to do before you begin actually exiting this hole. The way, the way things are set up. Right. And I was going to add to that, but I think you have the right point of, I was like, what if I take that money out of there, put it back, pay off my HELOC and then use my HELOC since I do have my license here locally. And I have some good relationships that I've built over the past year with contractors, different vendors, you know, would it be wise to use that money to start doing flipping of homes? But maybe, you know, with the consideration of what you were saying that the market is kind of sliding. So what do we want to... Regardless what the market is doing, your financial position is not strong, is not in a position that is conducive to flipping homes or buying real estate right now. You have no cash and you have multiple times of your income in consumer debt and then multiple more times your income in mortgage debt right now and properties that really do not generate meaningful cash flow at this point. You, you, you cannot buy more real estate until the position is, is in a strong position or you're, you're taking significant you're, – you're, you, you will then begin taking very real risks, very real steps towards bankruptcy at that point in time, in my opinion, if you begin flipping houses, for example, or, or buying additional real estate with this. I, you, you've really got to do the, the grind work of getting the financial position, in my opinion, set. You can work on the income front for sure. Side hustles or, or a business, if you want to do that for, for sure, are good. Are good. Um, I, would, I, would, I would start with capital allocation, your budget, and then, yes, use some of that free time to go after income opportunities like selling homes. Great. Love that. Use your license. Go make some money on the side on the weekends and evenings for sure. Great. The flipping, I am going to give you a different answer for that. I'm, I'm going to say no as well, but I'm going to say the market is softening. I'm not sure what it is at your location, but interest rates are rising and you could get yourself into a big uh, pickle flipping houses by buying a house and then holding on to it, being stuck holding on to it because nobody will buy it from you. Um, yeah. I don't love Scott's advice to sell your primary residence, but uh, I see where he's coming from. I don't know where you're going to live if you sell that property. If you, if you don't sell the primary residence, you've got to make 
major cuts to your expense to your day-to-day lifestyle on the budget front you've got to go even more extreme that that's the only reason is is if you sell your primary residence and rent somewhere then you will be able then you won't have to make quite as severe cuts on the on the other side of that if you're able to find something creative or, or downsized to a certain degree um but you don't have to sell your primary you'll just you won't you'll have to that you'll you'll then spend three to five years paying off your consumer debt at your current accumulation rate so sorry, Mindy. No, that's fine. I And that's what I would do first. That's personally what I would do because 2.99% is locked in for, what, 30 years? I would be surprised if we ever see rates that low again. It was They were too low for too long. And to give that up shouldn't be the first choice, in my opinion. That's why I would look at ways to cut expenses. But again, this needs to be a team effort. You and your wife need to have a conversation, have a, have a money date. Um, I'm going to reference yet another episode, episode number 157 from the bigger pockets money podcast, where Scott and I talk about how to have a money date with your spouse, um, more from the angle of where one of you has no interest in having a money date. So if the two of you talk about money from time to time, maybe listening to that episode together would be beneficial just to, you know, see how to, have the conversation and, oh, we can skip over this because we already do that. We should focus on this and just look at where you're spending your money and what is really worth it in your life and what you can live without for a month and see, you know, oh, I can live without this for a lot longer. Or, hey, you know what? I I really struggled. I would like to add that back in. If you cut 90 things and you add back three, that's a huge win. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really appreciate your time today, Shane. I think this was very interesting, and I hope that we gave you some things to think about and some uh, some tax to take with with your finances to get you on the right track. Yeah, I really appreciate all your guys' advice, and that's yeah why I jumped on this uh, this call is to really get a, a fine tone on uh, obviously our expenses. And I know the past, I want to say, a couple months have gotten. Um, a little bit away from us. Uh, those weren't <laughs> the the expenses that I shared were from the previous month, and they aren't like that every month. Um, but they are obviously starting to to slide. So um, really understanding using that um, price point that I'm in, and you know my my other side is I really want to get into real estate. So um, obviously taking your advice really honestly and, and clearly, and, and I really appreciate your honest opinion on. Um, my venture with that because that's that's clearly where I want to go, but I obviously need to make some corrections on my side from the sounds of it, and I uh, wholeheartedly agree. So love it. Well, really appreciate the time. Thank you so much, and hope to hear from you about what you end up deciding in uh, of the next couple of months. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, definitely going to be thinking about it pretty hard. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Shane. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. All right, Scott. You're a little. Uh... I don't want to say harsh because that's a mean word. And I don't think you were mean in your assessment of his situation. I think you were frank and I think you were honest. Um, but it it was probably a little eye-opening to hear somebody say, not only should you sell your rental property, you should sell your primary home too. Uh, let's let's talk about that, Scott. Yeah, I, I hope that the word, the word I would try to use to describe it as realistic. And sometimes reality is harsh um, in, in some of these situations. And I think I think that what, I, what I'm seeing here is there's a lot of debt. $900,000 in debt is a lot for somebody who makes a combined $140,000 when earning all of the bonuses um, that, that are due. That is, a, that is a huge amount of debt. Um, that is six times annual income. Not all of it is mortgage debt either. Um, and so I, I think that's a completely unsustainable position. And I think it's I think it's a major issue. I completely understand the argument that hey, a lot of that's financed at low interest rates. That matters when we've got a cash flow positive situation and we're wondering about some puts and takes in a minor way about investing versus paying off debt. But in this case, this debt could very easily consume the financial position of of, uh, of Shane and his wife. And so. Th- for me, that throws out the interest rates are a distant consideration to how do I get to a path of sustainability here? And I, I frankly did not see one. Even if they start saving $2,000 a month, which is cutting $4,000 of their monthly spend out, that's more than half of their monthly spend. That is an extraordinary change in your lifestyle um, if you do not move, for example. Um, even if they do that, they are 10 years that's 200, 240 times 
24,000 times 10 is 240,000, 10 years away from really cleaning up a lot of the debt in their financial position on that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's unacceptably long. Yes, if they made it through that 10, 15, 20 year stretch, they could conceivably have paid off that debt, gotten the cash flow out of the property, maybe benefited from appreciation and mortgage, mortgage amortization. And maybe, maybe there's a way to mathematically run a model where you end up with more wealth than just resetting and then beginning to build wealth in the, by investing in stocks or a house hack or whatever it is from a position of zero debt zero, you know, maybe a few hundred thousand dollars in assets. But I, I think that the the personal cost and life cost and freedom cost in that time period is going to be way, is going to be unacceptably high. They're going to have to grind it that entire time. So for those reasons, I think that this situation calls for a total reset of selling everything, move, becoming a renter again, cutting the expenses, cleaning up the phone bill, cutting out the subscriptions, Starting to make a lot of a lot of things at home, really reorienting the, uh, the the life around something that is sustainable, and then building from there in a way that has an emergency reserve and that can sustain uh, uh, responsible investing in long term assets. So that's that was my thoughts on the situation, and I and I I just don't see a way to do it in a in a reasonable way that doesn't take ten years um, without making really big changes in the primary residence piece in this scenario. Yeah, and I really appreciate you coming in and sharing that. I think a lot more people, I didn't see that. And I think a lot more people think like me than think like you. And for you to point that out, it is going to take 10 years of really grinding it out to get back to zero. Yeah, That's, that's kind of a really, really long time. And a lot can happen in 10 years. Um, so I'm glad that you are here to provide a different outlook than what I'm seeing, because that while stark and frank and uh, honest and realistic, it's also something that he needs to hear so he can look at what he's doing. And maybe he chooses to keep the primary mortgage, gets rid of the second home, which wipes out a large portion of this, which is the HELOC. He would pay down the pay off the HELOC, pay down the four hundred one k loan. He would still have some other debt, but then he's got uh, twenty seven thousand dollars in a short term rental. I mean, he could conceivably, with paying off the second house, pay off the HELOC and pay off the four hundred one k loan, and now we're down to like forty five thousand dollars in debt, which is a lot more manageable. And by the way, I'd sell the car too. Okay. Sorry. Nobody's ever going to apply to be on this show anymore, yeah. Scott. <laughs> so speaking of which, if you would love for Scott to uh, be realistic with your finances, you can apply to be on the show at biggerpockets.com slash finance review. We are looking for all scenarios because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone. Even Shane in his situation, we believe everybody can achieve financial freedom. So let us help you see where you can make cuts and changes in your finances to get to your financial freedom as well. And I would love, I would love feedback on uh, these thoughts. This is the most extreme position I've ever taken on the Finance Friday episode here at Bigger Pockets Money. So I'd love feedback in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube or in our Facebook group at uh, facebook.com slash groups slash BP Money. Please let me know. Um, maybe, maybe there's a solution that I'm not, I'm not seeing here that uh, you'd prefer or that you'd have given. And I, I would love to, love to get that feedback. Yes. And our Facebook group is found at facebook.com slash groups slash BP money. And I'm going to go in there and start a thread this morning to ask about comments for Scott on this show and comments about Shane's position. Uh, okay, Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. From this episode of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench and I am Mindy Jensen saying we've got a scoot newt. <laughs> 